Chandra to the dais and Dr. Vijay Raghavan sir. So this uh, refraction simplified is a topic for uh, beginners and postgraduates. So we have selected topics. Next slide, slide please. So we have selected some topics which will be useful practically. And uh, can you switch off this light also? Okay. So the first, Dr. Vijayaravan sir will talk first because he's got a parallel section. He will talk about slide next. Next, he will talk about. Hmm? Light, light. So prescribing best classes. And then I will be talking about retinoscopy simplified in day-to-day -day practice. And then uh, Dr. Sandra will talk about refractive errors in children. And finally, Dr. Mohan from Chennai will talk about contact lens dispensing. Dr. Sandra heads the pedi uh, is, uh, is a senior medical officer in pediatric department of Arvande Hospital. Professor Vijay Raghavan sir is a teacher for all of us and uh, teaching in many institutions. Dr. Mohan is ex from Arevo Jewels who worked in Konya department. Uh, so I request Dr. Vijayaragun sir to start his first talk. <coughs> next, next slide, put. Next, put. Next. Next present button. Next press, press button, Zami. Add the key press. Thambi, next, next button. Okay. So I will talk about uh, prescribing best glasses. Second presentation, second presentation. Good morning. I thank uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar for this opportunity. And uh, of course, he'll be talking about uh, retinoscopy and all. And in fact, I will come to the last stage that is called prescribing glasses. But uh, anyhow, but prescribing glasses is itself is an art. Please remember that we have to prescribe glasses based on patient's visual complaint and the result of our subjective examination of course the retinoscopy values and all these things but the problem is whatever retinoscopy findings i've got i cannot force the glass on the patient the reason is he may not accept sometimes that to the cylinders and all i will get a cylinder of 120 and when i prescribe he may not be accepting that's the reason we have to follow after retinoscopy and all we have to again re-examine the person and prescribe the proper glasses then only can be happy I'll tell you how to avoid the intolerance and all in the patient. One by one, I'll tell you about the stages or uh, different refractive errors. See now, myopia. In young persons, if you've got a low degree of myopia, up to minus six and all, always the dictum is don't overcorrect. Don't overcorrect. But up to minus six and all, tattoo in young children, we can prescribe to the full, full that is a full correction can be given. Whereas the same thing in minus six below and all, in adults, better to undercorrect. The reason is, for near, you will be very happy. For distance, we don't want that. Um, he may be having some, you can see distance also, as well as the same. He can read near also, because naturally, he will have presbyopic problems. Suppose a case of high myopia, the highest correction with which the patient is comfortable, you have to prescribe. That means, here also, please undercorrect. Please, here also, you have to undercorrect. Again, it will be useful for your near. Never, never, never overcorrect. That's a dictum. You know the problem here. When you overcorrect, imagine, by, suppose he's minus five. You are my, he will be minus six. He will try to bring his accommodation 
and to see distance very nicely. He will see now. The problem is what now? He will get pseudomyopia. He will develop a spurious myopia. That's why his accommodation becomes active and then he can bring and he can see better. That's why he never prescribed and because he has been constantly accommodating also. Now come to hypermetropes. Hypermetropes below the age of 6 is physiological. Only when the patient has got a problem of squint or when the power is high prescribed to the patient. Suppose the ch children, 6 to 16 years and all, a small error can be prescribed, <coughs> can be prescribed. But if the power is more than 3, ask him to wear constantly or otherwise he may be comfortable in reading purpose that whatever thing suppose he has got a plus point for your one he will be comfortable with the near but the distance he is going to use as accommodation and see better that's why always you ask him to see for near distance if he is comfortable he will prescribe that glass again the dictum is do not over correct hypermetropia the most important thing is always under corrected now come to presbyopia Whenever I get a problem on presbyopia is that do not give immediately his age is 41, 45, 1.5, like they don't prescribe. Of course, that is maybe useful for near vision purpose, the for reading purpose. But the actual problem, you should know the job of the patient. He may require different glasses. He may have to, suppose he's having plus two, you have to reduce it to plus, that means ready by one to see the computer and the worker and all. That's why always you should know the reading or his work what is his job, nature of job, then only he can prescribe the glasses. Otherwise, for reading, okay, you can prescribe, doesn't matter. But the problem is for his nature of job, you have to know for that, we have got one is called as, <coughs> the rule is called Donders rule. You know the rule. The Donders rule is what? First, I will find out, you might have heard about the Royal Air Force ruler. With that ruler, I will find out the near point of accommodation for the fellow, for the person. That means what? I am going to find out how much of accommodation is left in the patient already. See, after 40 hours, accommodation is going to fail, that's okay. But how much of accommodation is left in the patient, I have to find out first. That is with RAF ruler. Once I have found that, and you see what his job requires, how much the power. Suppose I want to work, imagine one example. I want to work at 25 centimeters. You know now, we see the four, focal length is 25 centimeters. We know that power of the patient is what? 1.25 meters. That means he is already, also his, his nature of job requires four diopters. By chance he has got a 50 centimeter, that is um, near point of accommodation. He is having already two with him. That means his job requires four. He is already having two with him. You can prescribe two, okay. But the problem is what? You have to keep something, accommodation that is two in the patient. You leave something in reserve. That means half or one third in reserve. Then you prescribe the remaining glasses. But you understand how hopes you. That is, you have to leave something one third or half of the accommodation left in the patient as a reserve so that you can use that accommodation in sometimes in, if required he can use that accommodation that's why always you first first find out the accommodation left in the patient what is the amount of accommodation that is a uh, power that is required for his re, for his work and prescribe leave one third in reserve there's a classical rule and in the normally come when we ask in postgraduate examinations then near of course never prescribe high reading questions and one more important point when you suddenly prescribe you know bifocals and all these things what happens the patient when he looks down you get now up that jump he may jump is taking place that means he will have once you come climbing under down the stairs and all you will have problems and that's why you have to be you have to caution the patient you have this problem he may jump or the may displacement so many things can take place that's why you have trouble in coming climbing down the stairs how to overcome this is a classical thing I think any, I don't know postgraduate is here or not, but um, you should know these common exam questions. <coughs> I hope, I'll tell you, myopia, <coughs> suppose I'm having minus two for distance. I have to prescribe for near now, suppose plus three, because he's having myopia. I will prescribe what type of cryptoc or um, flat bike, so, you know, flat top bike focus and all these things, there are so many things. Now, better is, please remember, better is, this is called as, can you see this, this is, pointer. pointer. Better is always for myopia patients. So myopia patients, you can see now, is a class of flat top, D by focals. You know why? The optical center of the myopia, that's, it's a concave lens in, for the distance. So now the optical center of the distance portions and the optical portion of this 
near vision portion, they be very close. That when they are very close, the jump is relieved. Suppose it's far off, naturally you get a jump is more. That's why better, please remember, better for myopia is flat topped. Whereas a hypermetropes, they will have a concave lens, sorry, concave, convex lenses. So naturally the optical center, suppose if I prescribe the same thing, they will have distance pro problems. That means what the optical center of upper portion, near portion will be la larger in the case of deep focals. That's why you prescribe cryptoc. Cryptoc, you know, the, I think you might have to go about optics and all, but just remember this. Optical, that is near vision portion, we have got um, cryptoc, it's a place where it's a round top, something like a round top. There the optical center of the near vision portion is nearer to the optical portion of the upper, vision, upper segment, naturally the image jump is less. It's a dictum of always, of course, depends upon the patient. He may accept even cryptoc also, the myops. That's, that's different. But it's the theoretically if possible you know, to avoid image jump. Myopic patients better prescribed flat bifocals, that is flat top. Hypermetrope individuals better with cryptoc, that is round top. These are, of course, to avoid all these things only now we have got um, progressive glasses, progressive lenses, so they can avoid, you can say distance, near, as well as everything, instead of wearing bifocals. But it takes time to get, um, as a, as that is called, um, you have to adjust with the so you know, progressive lenses, so it takes time to get adjusted, then it will be better. If you come to astigmatism, no? suppose patient got an axis of, I tell you, 135 has been wearing for the past 10 years. Now I am examining the person, he is getting 170. Never prescribe. Never prescribe the 170 because I got 170, I should not prescribe. He has been comfortable to 130, we prescribe 130, it doesn't matter. Because he has been comfortable, he may not accept. Then he will come, next day he will come and tell you, sir, I am not comfortable. That is why whatever the cylinder the patient has been using, to access has to be given just to follow that. That's enough. Then, don't advise the patient, uh, you go and get the glasses and all. This is very something, even for small change of powers. Always better before prescribing. You know what is called to work, good overcome test. Confirm he is better with these glasses. Whatever glass you have prescribed is better. Then only you can prescribe to the patient. Now, important point, you make the patient, you, suppose he may be having his old glasses and keep the old glasses with him. Then you prescribe your glass and ask him to compare before writing the prescriptions. If the patient says old glass is better, don't go ahead. Because if the patient tells you, yes, I'm having really improvement with this new glass, prescribe him. That's the most important thing. Otherwise, next day you'll come and tell you, sir, my old glass is better. That's the problem with you patients. And myopia patients, one more important aspect, everyone knows that. See, blood sugar level increases, your problem also increases. Myopic condition increases, myopic status. And that's why you prescribe. If, if you are a case of diabetic patients, if there is sudden increase of myopia status, better again rule out blood sugar, then find out, decrease the blood sugar, and then you have to prescribe the glasses, then the patient becomes normal. Otherwise, don't prescribe, otherwise you will cut a sorry figure in the flat patient. One pattern I will tell you now, suppose he is having a 0.5 cylinder for distance, 0.5 cylinder for distance, the near vision is 1.5. See now, if the patient is really comfortable with 0.5 for distance, we prescribe. Otherwise, if he is comfortable with them without any glasses, don't prescribe 0.5 cylinder, don't force him. What they will give you now, now here is what, 1.5 sphere is for near. You take half the cylinder, 0.5 become 0.25. You prescribe as 1.75 sphere for the near. That's what is called half of the cylinder you have to take and add it to spherical. It's called spherical equivalent. Never, never, suppose if the patient is really comfortable with 0.5 cylinder for distance, okay. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. This is what I told you. I think I have understood something and uh, there is an art, really it's an art, please remember this. And uh, prescribing and uh, of course nowadays uh, we don't, and my advice is don't rely on opticians and uh, all these fellows. We have to prescribe, we have to do retinoscopy, we have to find out the problems and prescribe to the patient. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks for the tips. I now request uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar to present his retinoscopy simplified step by step. <coughs> Mm. 
Good morning once again. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vijayaraghavan sir. He's got another session. He's going to another session. Uh, this is a short uh, presentation on retinoscopy, which is very important for postgraduates and junior doctors where you're not dependent on refractionists. So generally, you know, refraction is something like we have got so many components, radius of curvature, the refractive index, refractive status, and the power and cardinal points. There are two systems, the corner system with 43 diopters and the lenticular system with 18 diopters to uh, contribute towards the refractive status. Ultimately, you can determine the refractive status either subjectively or objectively. What we are bothered is subjective refraction initially, but later on, to confirm that, we need to do retinoscopy. Even if your AR is good, sometimes there will be situations where only a manual retinoscopy will give you the absolute power. So this retinoscopy is an art by itself. From the time you see the patient preliminary, you talk to them, they have to cooperate, you know, especially children, they'll have all the spasm and all those things. The entire process is very uh, cumbersome. It may take 10 to 15 minutes, the doctor may say in five minutes, but the refractionist will take some time to get a perfect refraction. So this is something which you all know. In retinoscopy, there are three stages, elimination stage, reflex stage, and the projection stage. So this thing is, there are two types of retinoscopy. So one is the reflecting mirrors and the one other one is the self-eliminated, which we all use now. So in the self-eliminating, there are two types, copyland and Welsh Island. Welsh Island is what we use now. See, there are two uh, positions, you know, whether it is the sleeve is up or sleeve is down. One gives a concave effect, other is a plane mirror effect. So sleeve up is a short concave position, sleeve down is a plane mirror position. So the dry retinoscopy is something without dilatation, without any cycloplegy you are doing. Static is when the person is looking at a longer uh, object at distance, it is static. Dynamic is when the pupil is con uh, con uh, you know, constricting, so that means it's a dynamic, non-dilated retinoscopy. Wet retinoscopy is after cycloplegic refraction and you can do it any distance. The uh, one meter is ideal for postgraduates to calculate. But practically, two-thirds of a distance would be more practical because it's arm's distance. So the correction would be one by one for one uh, meter, it'll be one. For two-thirds, it'll be 1.5 diopters. And if you do at half a meter, very extreme short distance, it'll be two. Okay. So the reflex can be, you know, what you're going to see there. I'll show you a video. So when you do the retinoscopy, you can see the reflex moving. You can do, do change the uh, slit axis into any direction. So there you observe the movement of the reflex inside. Now. The image falls behind the patient or behind the observer, it is going to be with movement. If it, going to, if it is going to fall between the observer and the patient, it is going to be against the movement. And if the image falls at the observer, there will be no movement. That will be the neutralization point. So this is the basic principle of the movement of reflex. So there are some modelized initially because you can't practice on a patient. Like uh, the retina, very simple, uh, the, about 3,000, 4,000 rupees. You can do the retinoscopy, you can see the fundus, everything in this model eye. So this is very good. So the characteristic features, <coughs> one would be speed. As you come closer to the ne uh, neutralization point, it will become faster. As it comes very far off, on the other side or this side, it is going to be, uh, that side is going to be very speed, is going to be very slow. Then larger refractive errors will show slow movements and fast in small refractive errors. As it becomes brighter and brighter, that means you are coming closer to the neutralization point. So these are the features which will help us to determine whether you are away from or not. Here you can see all the three movements. The first one is with, with movement for an emetrope, myopia of less than one diopter and hypermetropia. This will be at one meter retinoscopy. For myopia at one diopter, there will not be any movement because uh, you understand, it is plus, plus one dist uh, meter of one meter you are doing, so distance correction would be one. So minus one would be the power. Myopia of more than one diopter, that means the image is falling between the patient and the observer, it will be against movement. This is the principle. So point of neutralization is the pupil will get totally eliminated, number one. There will not be any movement, number two. And when you overcorrect by 0.25, what was plus uh, with movement will become against movement. What was against movement will become with movement. This is what is called as neutralization point. So here you can see against movement. So this is available in the web. You can do it practically yourself with a uh, mouse, but then it will give you an idea as to how to correct. See, you can see against movement, they're putting minus powers. It's going on. As you go on, it see the slit is becoming sharper and crisper and brighter. And at this point of time, what's happening? It has become with. So they reduce it. At 2.5, you can see the pupil is eliminated. 
isn't it? So, minus 2.5 at 90 degree. So, like that you sit and do the retinoscopy. So, you change the axis and then start doing, okay. So, this is the way you do uh, this thing. Another thing would be, see, for the spherical power, whatever axis you keep, the beam and the image will be moving in the same direction, like the first one, okay. But if you see the slit in one direction and the image moving in another direction, that means you are dealing with a cylindrical power or astigmatic power. So, you have to see certain factors when you have a astigmatism. So, one would be the break, second would be the width, third is intensity and skew, I will tell you what it is. Break is see the beam and the slit and the image are not in the same line. So, there is a break. So, you have to bring both to the same line. Then the width is, you know, as it comes closer towards it, it will become narrower and crisper. When it is away from the slit and the image are different axis, it will become broader and duller. Okay, the other one would be the intensity, it will become brighter, brighter as you, when it comes to the alignment with the axis of the slit. And skewing, what is skewing? One is moving in one direction, the other is also moving in a different axis. So, this is called skewing. So, all these four things would be seen in a case of uh, astigmatism. Can you see this? So, it is moving in opposite direction and you have to correct the, see so you are moving the, now once you correct the axis of the slit, then you know exactly. So, from the trial, uh, 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 trial uh, frame you can find out which is the axis. Straddling is what? Once you come into the axis, once you come into the axis, you align the beam and neutralize. Then you turn the beam 45 degrees on each side. So, the brightness, the dimness, the variation, the dimness, the speed and the brightness will be same on either side. That means your point is just like something like your Jackson cross cylinder for which you do for the power, here you do for the axis. This is called as straddling. Okay. So, difficulties you can have when you have cataract and all those things, there could be a difficulty. Then most important would be scissor thing. One will move in one direction, the other will move in a other direction, which can occur in many uh, conditions like scarring of the cornea and so on. But the most important would be like this. If you can see, you can see one will move in one direction, the other one. Top is different, bottom is different. So, this is called scissor thing reflex. You need to see this perfectly in an undilated pupil so that you can aptly refer to cornea clinic for a uh, topography without dilated pupil. So, this is a scissors reflex. So, uh, apart from that marked irregular astigmatism scarring would cause all the abnormalities. Remember working distance of 1 meter is correction of 1, 0.5 meter is 2, at 0 0.67 two thirds of a length, arm's length is, uh, meter is 1.5. Drug corrections we normally have for atropin 1, homotropin 0.5, this is 100 percent confirmed. And cyclopent and tropic may do have drug corrections varying from 0.5 to 0.75. Don't think tropic only drug which does not have a drug correction is a only dilating drop which is called phenylephrine. Okay. So then when do you give drug correction? Remember only for plus spheres we give drug correction. Exceptions for plus spheres also whenever the biosin is in plus biopic age group or pseudophagic or uh, aphagic and lastly mixed astigmatism. I will tell you why not in mixed astigmatism. Never give drug correction for minus spheres or cylinders. So, only for spheres except these three conditions you need to give a drug correction. Now, what is with the rule? You see the axis both are parallel minus at 180 and plus at 90. This is called with the rule. Just the opposite of that would be plus 180 and minus at 90 is against rule. Steps of retinoscopy, I will give you two practical examples. All done at 1 meter, you can work out if you want. Uh, 180 degrees to plus 2.5, 90 degrees plus 3.5. What will be the next step? You tell fast, we will finish fast. So, what will plus 2.5 and talk aloud? Plus 1.5, correct? So, drug, so, the first step is plus 3.5, plus 2.5, this is the power cross. Next is the distance correction, plus 2.5 on 1 point. Is this clear? Yes or no? We are doing a distance correction for 1 meter. Then next step would be, take a subjective, which would be the sphere for a subjective, smaller power or uh, bigger power? So, you take plus 1.5 diopter spherical as the power and remaining how much you have? See, plus 1.5 is there all around. So, how much do you want at 90 degrees? Plus 2.5. So, what will you give? See, the same symbols are there, subtract. So, you give plus 1 at 180 degree, correct? 1.5 is there all around. So, if you give plus 1 at 180 degree, 90 degree will become how much? Plus 2.5, is that correct? You understood or not? Okay. The next would be, 
you need to transpose. When you would like to transpose is the question, you would like to give a minus cylinder, which will be better accepted. Power will be the same. So, but you must learn how to transpose. First step is algebraic sum of the both, correct? What is algebraic sum of the both? Plus 2.5. And now change the symbol and the axis. So it will become minus 1 at 90 degree, correct? So this is a transpose value. I will come to one more step. Is there any drug correction for this patient? Why? Why? Phenylephrine is almost coming to press biopic age. You got it? One, one. So, drug correction is not given for phenylephrine. And if supposing it's patient with a press biopic, you should not give. Okay? So, you follow all these four steps now? What is the next step? No drug correction. What is the next step? PMT. What would you like to do? Near vision, isn't it? How much will you give? You forgot the age, huh? 40 years. So, how much would you like to give? Plus 1. Ideally, plus 1 as age corrected. So, there are two ways. One is age corrected, which is plus 1 for 40, 1.5 and so on. Donder's rule is what Dr. V.R.V. E. sir told. I will come to that. I will give an example. So, this is what is a class prescription, correct? Plus 2.5 minus 1 at 90, correct? 6, 6 and you added 1 only to the spherical component. You should not do anything to the cylinder. Cylinder will come down just like that. You got it? Okay. What will be the diagnosis for this patient? Quick. Mixed astigmatism. How many want to say mixed astigmatism? Nobody, huh? Okay. Yes, Priya. Anybody who wants to say compound astigmatism? Oh, you answer something, man. No PGs here. See, this is compound hypermetropic astigmatism against rule with press biopia. Why against rule? Minus at 90. Minus at 180 is only with the rule. Correct? Okay. I will come to another example. So, this is the first step. Power cross. Then distance correction is 2.5, 1.5. Subjective is give a small 1 point. You have, you have, what have you done here? Plus 1.5. Smaller power you have taken. Spherical. Okay. And 1 at 180. Transposition will be plus 2.5 minus. No drug correction. Near vision and then prescription. These 8 steps, if you do in the exam, you will get 100 on 100. There is no doubt about it. Okay. One more example I will give you. This is how many year old patient? 27. Home at Ripon. Would you give a drug correction or not? Yes, yes sir. Okay. I will come to that. You didn't understand. Okay. So, power crosses minus 1.5 plus or minus. What is the distance correction now? Correct. Minus 1.5, minus 1 will become minus 2.5. And then plus or minus would become minus 1, correct. So, subjective you have seen there. You have taken the smaller power, minus 1 diopter spherical. So, it is there all around. You want 2.5 at 90. So, you what, what do you do? You have to subtract. So, 1.5 at 180 degree. So, minus 2.5. Now, you don't have to actually transpose because you already have a minus cylinder. If at all you want to transpose, you will get minus 2.5 and plus 1.5 at 90. How will you know whether this is correct or not, this transposition? Okay, go back to the sub distance correction and see. See, in the top subjective, you have minus 1, isn't it? In the subjective, you have minus 1 as spherical. In the transposition, the other axis should be the uh, spherical power. If there is any change, then it will not come. Okay, can you see? Minus 2.5 is the other axis. Here it is minus 1. So, when you transpose, the other axis only will become the sphere and the bottom you change the symbol and cylinder. Okay. No, no drug correction. Why? Why? What is the spherical? Minus. No drug correction for minus. Okay. No drug correction. Near vision, 27 years, nothing. So, GP will be like this. Minus at minus 1.5, 180, 66. And no near vision correction, isn't it? Is this okay? What is the diagnosis? Compound? Myopic astigmatism? With or against? With the rule? That's all. This is that. Okay. You got that. So, I'll skip this. I'll come only to this. Now, what is the diagnosis? Plus 0.5, yes. 
minus 190 plus 2.5 minus 190. What is the diagnosis? Okay. Mixed astigmatism against rule with presbyopia. Now I have given you three problems. Take two minutes and you tell me what is the diagnosis for all the three. I will give you one minute. Write the diagnosis. Done? Okay. Can any, anyone tell me what is the diagnosis for problem A? You go ahead. Nothing wrong. I'm telling if it's not wrong also no problem. What is the diagnosis for problem A? You got 2.75 minus 2.5 at 180. Compound? Excellent. With or against rule? So compound hypermetropic astigmatism with rule. Second one? Mixed astigmatism with or against rule? With the rule. What is the last one? Pardon? Yeah. Now transpose this for those of you who, didn't, who do not understand. If you transpose, you will get like this. Now though in all the three problems, there is a plus sphere and a minus cylinder. The generally you understand like this, you think it is a mixed astigmatism. It is not so. So there are th three possibilities. When plus or minus opposite are there, sphere is more than the cylinder. When the spherical power is more than the cylinder, it is called a compound astigmatism. When the cylindrical power is more than the spherical, it is called mixer astigmatism. Second one, can you see there? And when sphere and cylinder are the same, it is a simple astigmatism. Now transpose and see. Then it becomes both are same, correct? So what they said is correct. Compound hypermetropic astigmatism, astigmatism is plus at 90 with the rule, correct? Then what happens here? Both are different. Again, minus 0.25 and plus, both are not changing. Sphere and cylinder will, even if you transpose, there will be opposite sign. So this is mixed astigmatism. Here you got two powers, both are same. When you transpose, zero diopter spherical and plus 2 at 90. Plus 2.75 at 90. So the diagnosis would be like this. Compound hypermetropic astigmatism, mixed astigmatism and simple astigmatism. Simple astigmatism, what axis? Plus at 90. So it will become with the rule, okay? Now you follow how to make a diagnosis when sphere and cylindrical are different. Yes? This is the famous person who gave the scientific basis for many refractive errors. So Dondo's rule there are two. One is for hypermetropia. You prescribe manifest plus one fourth of latent. And the other one is scientific method of calculating neovision. So I'll stick on to neovision here. Dondo's rule, there are four aspects. This is what Dr. VRV sir was telling you. First, calculate what is the available power for the patient. Okay? Second, calculate what power is needed to read at whatever distance he needs. See, this is mainly meant for watch repairers and people who work in diamond companies and so on. Then keep one third as reserve and give the required power. This is the sign. If the same person is 40, you will give plus 1, for 25, you will give plus 1.5 and so on. So here what happens? So patient reads at 67 centimeter, needs to work at 25 centimeter. So what is the available power if you have to read at 67 centimeter? How much power do I have? 100 by? 100 by 67 is what? 1.5, correct? So I have a power of 1.5 diopters. I need to work at 25 centimeter. So what power I would need? 100 by 25 is 4. So I need to have 4 diopters. But I have only 1.5. So normally what you will give? You will give plus 2.5, isn't it? But don't do that. You keep one third as reserve. So what is remaining? If you keep one third as reserve, remaining power I have is only one diopter. So how much will you give? You will give three diopters, correct? So this is the scientific basis of giving neovision prescription. So ultimately when you give a prescription and do a retinoscopy, you want the patient to get a beautiful power. So on behalf of the local organizing committee, Dr. Narendran sir, Dr. Kalpana madam and Dr. Rodney, I'd like to thank all of you who have come to Coimbatore and hope you had a nice time. These are the people who work for the halls and contributed towards the success so far. Thank you so much for a patient resonance.
Now I'd like to invite Dr. Sandra to come and give a talk on refraction in pediatric patients. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar, sir, for uh, making me a part of this course. So I think uh, with Dr. Vijayaragwan, sir's talk and uh, uh, Chandrasekhar, sir's talk, many of the concepts about uh, general refraction would be very clear. I am going to talk now about uh, refractive errors in children. So this graph, if you see, it shows you the refractive errors that are seen in the newborn child. The, this is hyperopia and this is towards myopia. So if you look at this graph carefully, you see that most of the children are born hyperopic. And then what happens? As they grow, the power gradually, whether it is hyperopic or myopic, there is a tendency to emetropize. That is, as the eyeball grows, the eye uh, becomes uh, zero in its refractive error, tries to become. So it, uh, we also need to know a little about the developmental aspects here. Premature infants are mostly born myopic with or without astigmatism and full-term uh, newborn infants are mostly hyperopic, very few of them are myopic and also they have very high accommodative reserves. Coming to the preschool years, the axial length increases. Most of the growth in the axial length in children is in the first two years of age. Uh, so at birth, the actual length of a child is around 16.5 uh, to 17 millimeters. So uh, do you know what is the adult axial length on an average? around 22 to 23. So from this uh, 17, it becomes 23. And most of this growth occurs in the first two uh, years of life. And school going age, from uh, it grows very slowly from 3 to 13 years. It's only around 0.1 millimeters per year. So if it grows more than that, then there is a tendency to develop myopia. Whereas if this growth is very less, then the children remain hyperopic. So, uh, what, uh, why do we concentrate so much on the uh, childhood refractive errors? Because this is one of the most common causes of visual impairment. In fact, it has been included in the National Program for Prevention of Blindness. And uh, around 19 million children are uh, visually impaired and most of this is due to refractive errors. So uncorrected refractive errors, it's very easy to correct this and prevent amblopia and permanent vision loss in children. And economic burden of this is very high because you need to remember that in children it is a growing eye and uh, economic implications are quite huge considering the lifespan of these children. And myopia, uh, in fact the higher pathological myopia has a lot of blinding complications that is uh, impaired quality of life and social, economic and educational consequences. Uh, hence, we need to concentrate a lot on these children. So. Uh, there are various ways of testing the visual acuity in children. Less than five years, you may not be able to do a Snellens visual acuity. So if you see this child, this is child is uh, matching the Cardiff acuity cards. So you have, this is based on the principle of vanishing optotypes. So you have certain optotypes here, which if the visual acuity decreases, the child will no longer be able to point. So that is the principle here. And based on that, you can, it is usually done at 50 centimeters distance and Based on this, uh, you can calculate the visual acuity. It is very important to record visual acuity in all children, whether they are like one year of age, two to three years, three to five years. So we have different methods of testing the visual acuity in different age groups. So what are the challenges in children? Inability to maintain reliable uh, visual acuity. So we have to look at different ways of estimation. So in very young children, we do the cake decoration method. And even less than that, we can do like, uh, uh, like Teller acuity. And now you saw the Cardiff acuity. And the three to five years, we have the SG charts and the HOTV charts matching principle. And then the Snellens. And uh, mostly, uh, you cannot expect them to cooperate. So you need to find a way to go around that. And uh, there is a risk of visual deprivation and amblopia. And there is association with strabismus. 
So what's required in pediatric refraction? Mostly, we may, if we may not be able to get a good subjective refraction, so we need to rely on retinoscopy. Retinoscopy is the most uh, satisfactory and accurate method for objective determination of uh, refraction, but it's an art, as you already heard from the previous speakers. So uh, the refraction retinoscopy is done, and if you are able to get a subjective, so this is a matching uh, HOTV cards. You can see that the child is looking at the distance, and the child is preverbal, so the child doesn't know what it is, but can point out to you, and you can get an estimate of the visual acuity. Coming to auto refraction, auto refraction is basically used as a screening tool in children. We never prescribe based on the auto refraction. The auto refraction can be like this, or you can use a portable auto refraction. We usually use this in school screening um, uh, purpose, just for screening, and we can never prescribe based on this because it gives a lot of false myopic readings and uh, pseudo myopia even after cycloplegia. So what are the agents that we use for cycloplegia in children? They include atropine, cyclopentylate, and tropicamide. Most uh, children less than age of three, atropine is the gold standard because uh, to arrest accommodation. And uh, in hyperopic isotropes of any age, we use cyclo uh, atropine. And also when we get very strong accommodation, variable readings, pseudomyopia, in all these cases, we can use atropine. One person ointment, uh, it's a typo, sorry, it's two times daily for three days. And um, the uh, onset of action is within one hour, but uh, the duration is around two weeks. So we need to explain to the parents that the child is going to be a little photophobic. There are also some si other side effects like fever. When we prescribe the atropine ointment, we need to explain to the parents that they used to use a very small amount, just a rice grain size. And if the child is having fever, then they can stop it and give us a call. And we usually don't prescribe if the child is having any seizure disorders, uh, then we don't, we avoid uh, atropine and cyclopentylate. So cyclopentylate, the onset of action is within uh, 30 to 60 minutes and duration is 48 hours. So this is most commonly, we use cyclopentylate for first time refraction in any child older than three years. We apply it two times at a gap of 20 minutes and then followed by one drop of tropicamide and then we can do the refraction. Any older child repeat refractions, uh, we can use uh, tropicamide. So uh, this is just a rough guideline uh, for spectacle prescription in children. And um, uh, so you can see that zero to one years, only if the myopia is very high, around uh, minus five, hyperopia more than six, with squint plus three, astigmatism more than three. So the, in, uh, we don't usually, uh, we don't like to prescribe uh, in very young children unless the refractive error is quite significant. Similarly, in one to two years, again, you can see the values here. These are just rough guidelines. And uh, anisometropia, you need to prescribe earlier because you need to prevent amblopia. So coming to refractive error and strabismus. So what do you do when the refractive errors are associated with strabismus? If there is hypermetropia along with esotropia, then it's good. So you prescribe uh, full cycloplegic refraction. There is something called a high AC by A ratio. That means the, the near uh, isotropia is more than the distance isotropia. So that happens because the accommodative convergence to accommodation ratio is little higher. So such children would uh, benefit by the prescription of bifocal glasses. And myopia according to the visual needs. Because myopia with isotropia, the prescription will definitely increase the isotropia. But always we need to prescribe for the refractive error. Even don't think about the squint. The vision has to improve first. So whatever it is, we need to prescribe even if it is a myopia with isotropia and then tackle the isotropia later on. Coming to exotropia, exotropia with myopia is a good combination because when you prescribe for the myopia, it is going to decrease the exotropia again. Hyperopia, again, we need to correct it if it is if the child has a risk of developing amblopia. Um, nystagmus, uh, I think I'll leave that. Okay, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about myopia because uh, this is one of the most um, serious uh, issues that we are facing right now. And uh, the incidence of myopia worldwide, there is a lot of differences. If you see the Caucasian population, the incidence is quite less. Um, uh, in um, USA, Australia, the incidence of myopia is very low. Whereas if you see at uh, China, India, it's more China and uh, uh, Singapore population, it's more than 50% at 12 years. It's very high. Whereas in India, the population-based studies have shown around 7.5 to 10% around 12 years. So there is a lot of changes based upon the age, the ethnicity, and the rural-urban differences. 
So uh, this graph, if you see, is quite interesting. The gro global trends for the myopia between 2000 and 2050. So they project that by 2050, around 50% of the world population is going to be myopic, out of which 10% is going to be high myopic. High myopia being defined as anything more than minus 5 diopters. So you look at this graph, it's quite scary. This is where we are right now, and this is where it's going to be. So again, this is uh, driving home the same point. This is the uh, prevalence at 22,000. This is the prevalence that you would see at 2050. And uh, you see the uh, co across all age groups, the incidence of myopia is going to increase like anything. So what is what? So what if there is myopia? If there is a lot of morbidity associated with it. It's associated uh, with amblopia, strabismus, other um, cognitive dysfunction, many other uh, personality developments, poor school performance, very limited career opportunities, and also high myopia has a lot of retinal issues uh, regarding lattice holes, uh, macular degeneration, retinal detachments, cataracts, glaucoma. So all these incidents increases with high myopia. So what are the causes for myopia? One is uh, genetic predisposition. If the parents are myopic, there is around some 10 to 20 percent chance of uh, if both the parents are myopic for the child to have myopia. Prematurity, most of the children who are aggressive posterior uh, ROP treated, laser treated eyes, they have a high incidence of developing myopia. And environmental factors, these are the ones that we can concentrate on. The f uh, more and more evidence points out that as you, as the outdoor activity increases, Increases, especially exposure to sunlight, the dopamine increases in the retina, and as the dopamine increases, the myopia tendency is reduced. Ambient lighting, reading in very poor light, dark room, will increase the myopia. Prolonged near work, which all children are doing now, is increasing myopia. High pressure education systems, overuse of ele near electronic devices. So all these are modifiable factors. All these currently being performed in all... Uh, uh, households and schools and we are not concentrating that much on this outdoor activity aspect and that is why the global uh, prevalence of myopia is increasing. So uh, there are other diseases which are associated with myopia and hyperopia also. You can see a lot of syndromes here, uh, namely Marfan, Sticklers, uh, Night Blindness, Karate Atrophy, Congenital Glaucoma, ROP, all these associated with myopia on the other hand. Levers, uh, congenital amnurosis, cornea plana, myotonic dystrophy are associated with hyperopia. And um, certain conditions like a limbal dermoid, con uh, ptosis. When any child with ptosis, you, uh, you need to look for astigmatism. So um, high risk for progression in Indian Asian eyes, female, urban population, parents wearing glasses, if the child is having near esophoria with full correction, it can progress. And if there are posterior pole changes, these are all red flags. So this is a thing developed by Singapore. They, have, uh, they are more and more concentrating on including outdoor activities as a part of the school activity, reduce the school hours, increase the game period. There have been a lot of interventions to slow myopia. One of them is the COMET uh, or the Correction of Myopia Evaluation Trial, where uh, they studied the effect of uh, using uh, plus glasses for uh, 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 reducing the myopia. And they concluded that large lack of accommodation, if there is near esophoria, a new prescribed progressive addition glasses yeah, and bifocals, it tends to improve the visual performance. Uh, but uh, routinely it is not being uh, followed. Another study was the CLAM study, which is the contact lens and the myopia progression study uh, done in Singapore. Again, but this is uh, not very commonly followed. One of the most promising uh, interventions to slow the progression of myopia is the atropine for the treatment of study. Atom 1, atom 2 studies, and atom 3 studies have come out. So atom 1 used 1% atropine nightly over a period of two years, where and they showed that it slowed myopic <coughs> progression by 77% and reduce the axial length elongation uh, in the cases as compared to controls. But with the 1% atropine drops, there were a lot of side effects, including uh, glare, photophobia, and near vision problems. So they reduced it to 0.1, and now currently it is the 0 0.01 atropine which is being used. Um, uh, the studies have already, all the results have come out, and now it has recently been introduced in India uh, by various companies, and it is freely available. 
and even in uh, our clinic we have started this so uh, the thing is we have to use we can start uh, in children uh, who uh, show a documented progression uh, of around 0.5 diopters over six months and but the thing is the parents need to understand that it's a long-term thing they need to use the drops for at least two years and we uh, started by uh, by the age of six uh, six to twelve between the ages of six to twelve if they have progression and the parents are willing to continue and come for follow-up every four months and if they are ready to use this every day <coughs> so a uh, word about the national programs uh, so it's just uh, vision 2020 there is a high priority to uh, correcting refractive errors and uh, it's in the category of childhood blindness Le various school screening programs are being uh, followed and uh, the school screening is definitely very important for uh, uh, finding out these uh, errors earlier on a word about the frames whatever you prescribe if the frames are not good it's not going to really work so we need to look at uh, plastic frames hypoallergic frames the ones with uh, easy which are easy to wear and which do not like uh, uh, create some uh, irritation or something for the child so unless the frames are comfortable they're not going to use it thank you We'll have at the end of the session. We'll have after the last presentation. Questions? Uh, invite Dr. Mohan to talk about uh, contact lens dispensing tips. Good morning, uh, everyone. I thank Dr. Sandrasekhar and uh, Professor Aviyavri for giving me this opportunity. The topic given is contact lens dispensing tips. I think uh, it will be useful for the practitioners also. So, the indications for uh, contact lens, the highly motivated patient and a high refractive error, that is more important. And we'll have to talk, uh, go through the types and materials of the contact lenses, selection of patients, accessories which are needed at the clinic and the time to be spared. Selection of patients is a motivated patient and anisometropic patient. We'll have indications later. Accessories, the routine refraction set which you have in your clinic is more, more than sufficient. Along with that, a keratometer is uh, better uh, equipped. And then if you want a selective range of patients for uh, higher contact lenses like uh, ortho -K or other lenses, we need to have a topographer. And more important is the time to be spared because you need more time to spend with these patients to motivate them for fitting and then for post fitting methods. The advantages in the contact lens is the initial, in fact, comfort, but for some it might be some a little bit of discomfort, watering will be there, you'll have to reassure the patient. And uh, fitting will be easier if you sit along with the patient other than the optometrist, if you have time. And you'll have to talk about the advantages of uh, occasional wear and change of color of the eye and less chances of lens being dislodged which the patient might be having. The soft contact lens indications are optical, therapeutic, preventive, diagnostic and cosmetic and some occupational also. Contraindications, you will have to select the patients uh, accordingly. A poorly motivated patient, it's better to leave them alone and some inflammation around the lid, dacryosteritis, blepharitis or chronic conjunctivitis, it's better to avoid fitting contact lenses. And in case of dry eye syndrome also, it's better to avoid. And in case of corneal degeneration and dystrophies. And some idea about the low water content, the high water content contact lenses. The advantages, low water content is less susceptible to the environmental changes and which has a low protein deposition and it's easy, easy to manufacture. Disadvantages is a low decay. Decay value is the water content of the contact lens. High, high decay value, it's more flexible and faster restoration of shape is there. But the disadvantage will be the fragile, lower tensile strength and more deposit prone. This is the FDA classification for decay and DK, uh, decay by T values. T is the thickness of the contact lens. The higher decay by T, uh, T value, the thinner the contact lens. Types of contact lens, there are disposable contact lenses, daily disposable two weekly disposable or monthly replacement. It's a simple cleaning method which is used and latest designs and materials and it's more popular. And then there is the extended wear lens made from silicone material. 
color contact lens handling tint high myo patients will be having difficulty in locating the lenses during wear so tinted lenses will be better for them and uh, it's useful while inserting and removing the lenses also the materials which i use in the contact lenses are uh, hema hydroxyethyl methacrylate methacrylate polyvinyl alcohol type and n vinyl polyrhodium advantages of soft contact lens again comfortable and well tolerated the materials of silicon contact lenses silicon with hydrogel lenses uh, technical names are as mentioned above the soft contact lens types spherical aspherical toric and multifocal so each type has got different advantages a spherical soft contact lens bends slightly in e evenly in every direction and typically used to correct myopia and hyperopia Aspheric contact lens have varying curvatures across the surfaces changing from the edge to the center of the lens and different interaction between the light and lens entering the eye and makes a clearer image. So this is the FDA classification of the hydrogel lenses. Advances, advantages of the silicon hydrogel lens, more resistant to protein deposits, higher oxygen permeability, flexibility and it's good wettability also. Disadvantages. If there is going to be a little bit of uh, astigmatism, the visual acuity will be decreased and there is a lower rate of oxygen transmission and it's more fragile. And next coming to toric soft lenses, different focusing power, the vertical and horizontal meridian is present in this, corrects astigmatism. Additional design characteristics prevents the lens from rotating away from the required alignment. And there are some markings also in this. Fitting guidelines, first you'll have to select the lens type and then determine the lens power, total diameter selection, base curve selection, the trial fitting. So, and how do you select the uh, selection of the lens for the patient? Evaluation of the patient with the help of a slit lamp, tear film evaluation, systemic evaluation, and the expectation of the patient and the financial condition of the patient also is more important, along with the occupation and wearing time. It also depends on the refraction whether a patient is going for only a spherical or a toric or a gas permeable. And the comfort and visual acuity is also the first priority. And selection of the lens diameter is by horizontal visible iris diameter, which is uh, evaluated with the help of a transparent rule, which is placed in front of the eye, and you can take a cal uh, calculation directly. And you'll have to add two millimeters to the measurement which you are taken, so that the lens covers a complete cornea. How do you select the base curve? Base curve selection is from the K readings which you have evaluated previously. And usually the K reading will be flat, medium or steep as uh, accordingly less than 41, 41 to 45 or above 45. And the base curve for so soft contact lens will be specified as steep, median and fit, flat, depending on 8 to 8.3, 8.4 to 8.6 or above 8.7. And the power selection will be Manifest refraction, which you have done previously with the vertex distance conversion. I'll talk about vertex distance later. The, if there is going to be a plus cylinder, you'll have to convert it into a minus cylinder by transposing. And the patient's refraction should be the spherical equivalent in some cases. For astigmatic correction, you may need a toric lens. How do you determine the lens power? If, example, the subjective refraction is minus 4 with a minus 1 cylinder at 180, the spherical equivalent can be given. And because it is four diopters, you'll have to go for a vertex distance compensation. This vertex distance compensation, you've got a chart, you can take it from there. And what is the spherical equivalent? If the patient has got a mild astigmatic power, you can take a half a cylinder of the power from the astigmatic correction and then add it to the sphere and that becomes a spherical equivalent. If the cylindrical power is less than 0.5 diopters, you can ignore and you can just give the spherical power only. And if it is between 0.75 to 1, you can take half the power of the cylinder and add to the spherical component. And if it is if it is more than four diopters, then you'll have to go for the vertex distance correction. Because why we'll have to take for a vertex distance connection? The distance between the spectacle from the cornea is different. And as the lens goes nearer the contact lens, it changes. The contact lens is nearer the cornea, whereas the spectacle is away from the cornea. There are two methods. The simple method is the method to add half of the cylinder to the sphere 
and you'll have a calculation table, you can get the power directly, as mentioned in the as mentioned in the last thing. You need not go to the theoretical aspect of that. After fitting, you'll have to look for the corneal coverage. It should be adequate. The eye, when the eye is in the primary position, the full cornea should be covered and should have at least 1 to 1.5 millimeters away from the cornea all around. If it is greater than 2 millimeters, then the lens is too large and if it is less, the lens is too small. You'll have to fit accordingly. And it should be equally centered in all directions beyond the limbus. How do you evaluate the fit? Allow the contact lens to rest on the eye for five minutes before evaluating the fit. Lens centration after each blink should be evaluated and you can check the visual acuity after the contact lens has been placed on after five minutes. If there is no movement, then the lens is too tight. If there is excessive movement, it's too loose. And the visual acuity should be stable whether before, after the blink. Signs and symptoms of the steep fitting lens Fluctuating visual acuity, which clears after each blink. Then you'll have to correct accordingly, which I will mention later. In a flat lens, before blink, the vision, patient's vision is better, and after a blink, the lens gets decentered and the vision becomes dull. And in case of a steep lens, patient will have a blurred vision before the blink, and after the blink, patient will have a good vision. How do you modify this? If it is going to be a flat fit, tighten and decrease the base curve, but keep the diameter the same. So it will be inversely proportional. And if you are going to increase the diameter, keep the base curve the same. And opposite is the steep fit. The signs and symptoms I already mentioned. Visual acuity is unstable with each blink. Patient awareness of the lens, the foreign body sensation might be there. And because of the poor centering, there will be low fitting and lens might move to one place. How do you modify? If it is too large, decrease the diameter. But remember, the decreasing diameter may inadvertently <coughs> affect the base curve. And recheck your modification with the trial lens. You should have a trial fit ready. Complications of contact lenses. GPC, corneal abrasion, erosion, contact lens accused, uh, lens acute red eye, keratitis, ulcer, neovascularization. But all these are because of the handling of the patient. Suppose if the patient is going to travel, commute for a long time, at least two hours, and they use the lens when, he, when they step out of the house, they tend to sleep if they are not going to drive. And later on, they end up with a little bit of a corneal opacities. And then they like to stop using the lenses. So usually change the pattern of the application of lenses. Once they go to their office or the college, they can use the lens there. Conclusion, use patient interview to determine the lens type and the ocular examination to evaluate the base curve diameter and the power of the patient. And you should have a trial lens set to evaluate the lens fit. And you will have to take the visual acuity and over refraction if the visual acuity is not what was expected. Make any modification to the fit and uh, use trial lenses to evaluate modification. Explain the insertion, removal, care and handling and cleaning to the patient. Because if it is being deputed to somebody else in the front office, we have seen patients using the lenses for six months without removing the lens throughout and then they come back with a severe corneal edema and then they like to use just glasses in spite of the treatment given and the vision or visual acuity also suffers because of that. The final order of the contact lens should contain a base curve, the power of the lens, the diameter, water content, tint, material, manufacturer. This is for theory but outside for prescription we can have a base curve power mentioned and anyway we are going to talk about the uh, tint whatever is necessary for the patient. The base curve ranges from 6 to 11 but most are between 8.4 to 9. The power range is also different. Decentration I already talked, late decentration, early decentration and uh, unstable visual acuity and in cases of RGP lenses, discomfort lens edge might be too thick and excessive movement, it's too flat. The same thing, deposits also should be taken care of. The lens care products should be concentrated on because usually they, doesn't, they won't change the lens uh, care, uh, the solution in the case, lens case. So it has to be mentioned to the person and highlighted it. The best disinfectant is a hydrogen peroxide. 
at times it can be used or change the lens but examine the lens under the slit lamp if possible if the patient gives any complaints regarding that since uh, time faucet we can have the different other type of contact lenses available bifocal contact lens cosmetic and prosthetic lens orthokeratology therapeutic contact lenses keratoconus contact lenses in children and miscellaneous orthokeratology is a different type of lens where you have uh, reverse geometric curve lenses which is used during night time and the patient is removing the lens in the morning and usually the pre lasik patients are more better for the orthokeratology lenses one advantage is that the second advantage is it can be handled by the parents instead of the children so the visual acuity is maintained throughout the day and the next day in fact for some patients once in two days they use their orthokeratology lenses it's a rigid lens there are first generation second generation third generation lenses which have come but uh, in between only myopic plain myopic patients can be corrected with orthokeratology lenses at present there is a toric orthokeratology lens which is available very recently we are not sure about the effects of that and uh, complications for orthokeratology lenses is very minimal in fact we haven't seen any complications as of now other than the breakage of the lenses because of the handling therapeutic contact lenses will be used usually in uh, cases of uh, band, uh, in case of post keratoplasty patients because it's a plano lens and it can be used for one month at a stretch and it can be changed after two one or two months accordingly to the patient's comfort keratoconus again you have different types of lenses which is out of this purview uh, piggyback lenses hydrogel lenses and other lenses with this talk i thank you for thank you dr mohan we have some time for any questions yes sir on any of the topics to pain uh, it's preferable to put it in the morning or in the night no it's usually applied in the night time bed time and it can be removed in the morning no no atropine uh, the myopen trial no. sorry yeah, you can use it at night time night time is preferable yeah. ma'am for how many months do you have to use that like how do you assess the Uh, the progression uh, yeah at the start when you start uh, applying atropine you need to uh, do certain measurements you need to do the cycloplegic refraction you need to measure the actual length so uh, like uh, by the a scan so these two are uh, important and then you can call the patient after 6 uh, months or even if uh, they are complaint you can call them after 4 months also and then again you do you have to repeat the cycloplegic at each time refraction and you measure the actual length so uh, they say that uh, there can there could be progression even after you start on uh, low dose atropine because in some patients the effect come after a year okay. of using so it uh, most so in some children even if there is progression you still continue it for a year and see so in okay. the second year there is some uh, re reduction in the progression around 50 to 60% they say it reduces the progression if uh, even after a year if the uh, um, refractive error is still progressing then the patient is refractory and you can stop the treatment because we don't have uh, the higher percentage available in india okay. what they do in uh, singapore is if the, there is no effect with 0.01 um, uh, you can start using it twice a day instead of once a day also okay. uh, and even after that if there is still progression then you have to stop it or you go to the highest strength of 0.1 but that is not available right now Here. if there is not much progression how long do you continue it if there is not much progression you need to co continue it uh, for uh, like until at, until the age of 12 years at least to the age of 12 yeah thank you yes is uh, atropin is atropin drop in case of myopia uh, what is the percentage how frequently we should, we should put on what is the basic of uh, basis of this atropin sulfate drops to reduce the myopia yeah it reduces the accommodation because when the child accommodates more there is a increased myopia happening so it reduces the accommodation by acting on the ciliary body 
So relax will be in the night or day time? Uh, I just answered the same question, sir. It is to be applied at night. The previous speaker uh, question, uh, the same, exactly the same question she asked. It is to be applied at night, okay. once a day. How long? Around uh, two years at least. Two years at least. Yeah. Any other questions? How the glasses are prescribed for null zone at nystagmus? Uh, I'm sorry? How the glasses are prescribed for null zone at nystagmus as mentioned in your slides? Uh, yeah, when the patient, uh, you can give uh, prisms for the null zone. You can decenter the glasses to get a prismatic effect and uh, stimulate accommodation. So when the accommodation is stimulated, the frequency of the nystagmus is reduced. So but that helps to uh, reduce the, like, but that, that kind of improves the visual acuity. But that would be effective in only in convergence dampening cases of nystagmus? Uh, not exactly. You can, if they are having a significant refractive error, you can slightly decenter the glasses to get a prismatic effect. And okay. that would help to dampen the nystagmus. If there are no other questions, I'd like to thank all my co-speakers, Dr. Vijay Raghun, sir, Dr. Sandra, Dr. Mohan, and all of you for coming and attending this IC. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the speakers in this session. Our next session will start exactly at 10.30. Ah, We'll be playing the making of the AIOC 2018 video. Those who are interested can see.